you're seeing a Sloan School t-shirt. So, are you a Sloan School student? I'm, I am not. Everybody's here. I think we're about ready to get started. Let me just run through real quick to make sure we have all the teams. Race car, you here? Yeah. UAV. Yeah. UAV SAR. A little louder, guys. Come on, some enthusiasm. Uh, cyber, embedded cyber. Hey. They're in hiding. Metalytics. I like the enthusiasm. Cogworks. CubeSat. 3D printing. Hey. Is that everybody? I think that was eight. I'm good. All right. We're going to get started. So thank you all for, uh, for being here again. Uh, my name's Scott. I think I introduced myself on our first day here. I, I work with Lincoln Laboratory. Um, I had the fortune Friday morning of sitting in and help teaching the CubeSat class, and I'd say that I am incredibly impressed by everybody I've met here at the program. Um, you really are sort of the top talent in high school for, uh, for STEM disciplines, um, and it's, it's really, really impressive, and it's great for us to have the opportunity to interact with you and work with you. Um, you know, as you go forward in your career, in college, and then in your career, you know, one of the challenges that you're really going to face is how do you take your good ideas and, and realize them, make them something real, make them so they make a difference. 
right? And being that bridge, trying to take uh, take uh, good ideas and engineering and science and, and make them into reality is, is a really challenging thing to do. Um, we're very fortunate today that we have one of the leaders in the field. So Professor Fiona Murray is here from the Sloan School, uh, where she is the associate uh, director of innovation at the Sloan School. She uh, sits on a number of sort of senior panels, both in the US and uh, in the UK on the areas of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. And she's gonna talk today about uh, sort of two key issues, both that how you were the how do you become the bridge, how do you realize new technology, and then a key part of forming uh, teams as we move forward in the startup cultures and then larger companies, um, uh, which is diversity. So we're, we're very, very fortunate to have her, to he have her here with us today. So please welcome uh, Professor Fiona Murray. Well, thank you for that introduction, um, and thanks all of you for being here. Uh, I think you guys get a free lunch, so in my experience, the thing that really gets certainly my undergrads when I teach them, uh, I teach my undergraduate class with my colleague, Vlad Bulovic, who's an electrical engineer, and Vlad and I teach a class together for MIT undergrads about innovation, and our class is scheduled at nine in the morning, uh, which for an undergraduate is a horrifying thing. Uh, and the way that we solve that problem is that we normally give our students on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we give them coffee and donuts. Uh, although we've started to give people fruit as well because we think that's a little bit more healthy. And the mom in me thinks that everyone has to be healthy as well. So free food is a thing that goes a really, really long way at MIT, um, including getting you guys here in the room. So I just want to say thank you to all of you for being here. Um, I, I have, uh, so I've worked at MIT for a really long time. Uh, it'll be 20 years next year. Uh, I actually remember the first day I started here. I did my PhD in engineering and applied math up the river at Harvard, and I used to take MIT classes. Um, I'm a chemist by undergraduate training, so a really sort of STEM kind of a person. And I did some MIT classes as a PhD student, and I decided it was just a little bit too difficult. And I would go back up the river to Harvard where it was just a tiny bit easier. Um, <laughs> so, and then I ended up here on the faculty. And actually, a lot of the faculty here, funnily enough, um, applied to MIT at various points in their academic careers and didn't get in, and then find themselves being professors here. So regardless of what happens and where you guys go to college, uh, there's lots of different paths to getting to work at some amazing institutions. Um, the other thing that's really striking when we sit around, um, both among the faculty here, is so many of us, myself included, are not US born, um, I'm not sure anyone can work out where I'm from. <laughs> so I have a very Irish name. It's actually a Scottish name. Well, at least my father insists it's Scottish, not Irish. But that's a kind of inter-Celtic rivalry that they have. Um, I'm from the UK originally, and I'm actually still not a US citizen. I haven't quite brought myself to getting a US passport. And at the moment, I'm really sure I can't do that. So, <laughs> I, But my what I thought was my... Um, a European passport turns out to be only a British one, I think. So it's not going to be a European passport for very long. So, But enough of politics. Um, so my job on campus is to both be a professor and to teach and what have you. And I have a privilege of I teach our executive MBA students, who are our mid-career students. Uh, they're sort of people like me. Um, the older you get, the older the students are that they give you to teach. But I also get to teach the undergrads. So I get to teach people who are like you'll be in a year or two's time. Um, and it's a real privilege to do that. The undergrads here are really fun and smart and interesting. Uh, they ask hard questions. Um, they sleep through lots of the lectures. You don't think anybody's paying attention. Uh, and then they show up and ask a good question. So I'm, I'm used to that, which is a really different experience. Um, and it's one of the things that's so striking to me is in all the time that I've been here, one of my roles now is to help people think about how we educate all of people like you, people like me, with STEM expertise who really love what we do in STEM, but also want to make a difference in the world. And increasingly, so when I was an undergraduate, this is a UK phenomenon, but I think it was true in the US as well. Most people, if you ask them what they wanted to do when they graduated, said that they wanted to be investment bankers and management consultants. And indeed, the friends of mine who've gone on to do that, who made those choices, 
uh, you know, now have very big houses and are really successful in those dimensions. Um, I didn't choose to go down that path. I did my PhD and then became a professor. Um, and what I've noticed over the years is that people are making really different choices. And a lot of what people talk about, I think, is the things that you're thinking about today, which is how do you take all that STEM stuff that you're learning, that really deep expertise, and really do something useful with it in the world. And so, so that can be fundamental research. It can be the kinds of extraordinary research that happens in Lincoln Labs, and they do some really cool things, some of which they can tell us about, and some of the stuff they can't tell us about, because if they tell us, they might have to kill us, and so they can't tell us those things. But it's really amazing and very important for our security. And sometimes it's about getting products into the hands of people who really need it. But all of it is about solving problems. And I think that's a really uh, common and growing thing. And what we see among our students, and I just want to show you some numbers, is a real change in people's career choices. Now, this data is a little bit out of date, but what this graph is showing you is of all the folks who are graduating from undergrad from sort of 2006 to 2014, what you can see is that at the time of 2006, 2007, almost a third of people graduating were going into finance. Right? That's when Wall Street was the most cool thing in the universe. And what you saw is that going down over time until today, you know, it's somewhere in the 5% range. It doesn't mean it isn't an amazing and interesting thing to do. It's just a real change in people's preferences. Why do you think that is? Why, why is that? Yeah. OK, so technology's on the rise. Yeah, and maybe that's more interesting. Yeah. Yep, so people are looking at what's cool, and so maybe different things are cool than they used to be. What else? Yeah. 2008. Yep, say more. 2008, good date. What happened in 2008? The financial crisis. Yes, not everyone in the room might know that, but good. <laughs> we hope they do, but not everybody does. The so 2008, huge financial crisis. So what does that mean? So financial crisis, and so it wasn't cool? Yep. So certainly, a lot of people said, eh, maybe I don't want to be an investment banker because that isn't, that's not just not cool. That may be something that really doesn't seem so positive anymore for the world. Also, those people weren't showing up on campus to hire. Right? So the banks were massively downsizing. So they did not show up on campus to career fairs and things like that. And so for a little while, people really had to think about creating their own jobs. And you can see it actually took a while. So 2008, still hiring. And then there's this real kind of tightening. Um, and actually, for the first time, for a long time, some of our students weren't getting jobs. And so what people ended up doing is creating their own jobs. And so a lot of people started to become entrepreneurs, found companies, create companies. But increasingly, people, I think, realized that's a hard thing to do. We all associate entrepreneurship and starting companies with people like Mark Zuckerberg, who did it when he was a Harvard undergraduate, or even Bill Gates, who dropped out of Harvard to start Microsoft. Actually, the average, well, does anyone know what the average age of a venture back, so a kind of a high growth potential entrepreneur is? Have a guess. Yeah? 40. 40. OK. Another. Yeah? 26. 26. 56. 52. 52. Cool. Yeah? 33. 33. 20. Yeah? 27. OK. So it is actually about 42 years old. <laughs> Extra cookie for whoever said that. Um, what that tells us is that entrepreneurship can be for people like you sitting in the room. It can also be for people who are older. That many of the high growth companies are actually founded by people who are a little bit older, who have industry experience, who understand. So if you're talking about social media, you know, B2C and what have you, that tends to be started by younger people who kind of know how to turn on their iPhone. Um, if it's things that are more in life sciences, biotech, clean tech, tough tech, you know, creating a startup with a new fusion reactor like our friends at Commonwealth Fusion Systems uh, in the physics department, they tend to be a little older. But what's happening, and they're taking their industry experience and transforming it into creating a startup, but they're still hiring really young teams. And so we see people starting to join young startup teams as kind of first employees, like among the first 10 people who join. And that's sort of an amazing and interesting career path. Because you can start doing that, and then you get some experience. Maybe you go to a big company for a little while, and then maybe you decide to join to start your own company. And so, just thinking about that, one of the things I wanted to ask you guys, and you know, you haven't even decided, I think, where you want to go to college. But I'm just curious, what do you think you want to do? 
What kind of organization do you want to work in? And what kind of skills do you think you might need? So let's take the first question. So what do you think you want to do when you grow up, quote unquote? That sounds like the kind of thing you'd be asked by your aunt over Thanksgiving dinner. But I'm going to ask you. <laughs> I'm going to ask you anyway. So what do you think? Yeah. You want to be a propulsion engineer. Cool. I like that. Why? This is not a college interview, by the way. I don't do that. So go just have Why? Okay, so we like rockets and we want to propel them around. There's a really cool MIT startup called Axion Systems that does. Um, do you know that one? Did you hear? Look at that. We're so joined up here. Who knew? Was that Nat did Natalia come and speak? Ah, good. Okay, so very good. So you should go and work for Natalia's team. That's fantastic. We're very proud of Natalia. She's one of our amazing PhD students, and we we love what she's doing. And uh, she's a really important, I think. Representat representative of both being an amazing startup founder of Tough Tech and also being a female founder, which is, remains an unusual thing. So uh, she's amazing. Uh, all right, so propulsion engineering, good, we like that. What else? Yeah. On the new, like, um, automated stock trading, just using Ooh. programming. Okay. And then become a freelance just after. Okay, so cool, I like that. So you're going to sequence your impact in the world. So automated stock trading and then philanthropy. I like that. Yeah, behind you, yeah. Hang on, Shh. what? Automotive engineering research. Automotive engineering research? Good, why? Okay, you love cars? Yeah. I have an undergraduate student who's actually gone this summer to work for McLaren in the UK, which is one of the big, you know, really cool and interesting car companies. And he was on the race car team, which I guess is doing similar stuff to what some of your teams are doing. And he's done that for a bunch of years and is now doing that. So that's sort of interesting. Yeah. Okay, so engineering program prosthetics. That's super important. Uh, any of the young women in the room, what do you guys want to do? I want, I've heard from all the boys. Okay. Uh, Shh. Maybe have maybe teacher. Okay. Maybe start my own food business. Your own business? business. Food business? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I like that. I have a former student, his name, her name is Shireen. She has a company on the West Coast that actually does gluten sensors. So she had food allergies, gluten food allergies. So she's developed the sensor technology so that you can tell whether there's gluten in your food without having to have a chemistry set and wait for half an hour before you, um, before you know when all your friends are finished. So there's some interesting food stuff uh, that we can do. One more, yeah. Uh, like real estate or civil engineering. Real estate or civil engineering, building, excellent. And you are in Manhattan, is that right? So plenty of big buildings there. Yeah. My brother-in-law builds buildings in Manhattan, but he only builds foundations. So he kind of builds it up to ground level, like all the tunnels underneath the World Trade Center and what have you, which is kind of cool and huge and amazing. All right, so those are some cool things. Let me ask you, what kind of skills do you think you're going to need to do any of the jobs that you've described or the thing that's in your head? Yes? Being able to talk to people, communicate your right. ideas. Uh -huh. Yes. Being able to talk to people. Yes. So there's a really old joke that many of you may have heard. Um, how can, at MIT, how can you tell the introvert from the extrovert? Mm -hmm. And so it goes, as so the extrovert is the one looking at the other person's shoes, not down at their own shoes. So, <laughs> so being able to communicate your ideas, you can have the best ideas in the world, for learning to communicate, so some of you do debate. We already had that discussion. Just being able to communicate in whatever way, shape, or form. Uh, my son is only is 14. He'll be horrified at being mentioned. I think there's somebody in the room who knows him. Hi, love one. Um, you know, I, he is a math kid like some of you in the room, and he hates writing. And I keep saying to him, it doesn't matter how much math you know. If you can't communicate your ideas, nobody will care. And so you've got to be able to learn to communicate could you please learn to write? That would be super useful. So communication is very, very important. What else? So we agree communication is one thing. Okay. Let me see if we can get anybody else who can communicate their thoughts. Yes. Is it program management? <laughs> program management. OK. What does that mean? That sounds uh, right to me. Having the ability in order to be able to uh, operate on multiple different things, uh, different time schedules, being able to manage mm -hmm. people. 
good. Yeah. Okay, so take apart a complicated problem and kind of wrap it up into some specific and, yeah. and sort of make a plan for that. Yeah, what were you going to say? Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. You guys get to your, I understand. We're managing collaborations with that group. Okay. Being able to target what certain people's skill sets are. Yeah. Being able to adjust the workload based on those skill sets. Yeah, so allocating the right work to the right people as part of that program management. Yeah. Creativity. Creativity. Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah, so kind of thinking about things, not just going down one narrow thing right away. Way at the back. Thoracic hmm? Thoracic surgery. So thoracic surgery is what you want to do. What are the what are the skills in addition to being? <laughs> We're on the next question. <laughs> It's okay. You guys are a very nice group. I mean, it's very fun. <laughs> That's a bit harsh to give you grief, but go on. What? Dexterity. Dexterity. Indeed. That's absolutely true. I'll take that. Yep. What? An open mind. Yeah, what do you mean? Okay, yeah, so open to new people and new ideas. That actually turns out to be really hard. It's very, very important. Yeah. Actually know how to do the work, like programming and the engineering. Yeah, yeah. Actually know how to do the work. Yeah. In this room, I'm actually going to assume that all of you eventually will know how to do the work. And actually, that's going to be the easy part. Now, that isn't always true in this universe, but I actually think that for many of you, that's going to be the easy bit. And it's all these other things that we're going to have to layer on top of that that are actually going to be the challenge. All right. Yes. Uh, yeah. OK. Uh, uh, you first, and then you. Uh, certain patients. Patients? Not patients that are going to visit the thoracic surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to be very dexterous. We know that. Um, patients like not getting frustrated too easily. Yeah. yeah. So patient with other people, patient with yourself. Right, which is also quite important and actually quite difficult sometimes. Yeah, what else? Uh, you need to be like resilient. Yep. So, can you say more about what that means? What do you mean? So, like, you need to be able to, like, first of all, you shouldn't be like afraid of stuff happening. Mm -hmm. like, let's say you lose a job. That happens a lot if you work at startups. Yeah. So then you yeah. need to be able to, like, bounce back. And then yeah. You shouldn't blame yourself and you should be like. Yes. So, there's a really interesting tension, but in my view, between. The self-belief that you need either to start a company or to join a young company where you really have to believe in things and a sort of, uh, which makes you resilient and being delusional and not actually taking in information. It's actually a very difficult tension that people find really hard and actually in my experience the people who find this the most difficult are actually engineers. Um, if you actually look at the failure of products in the marketplace, so if you look at the whole catalogue of like the hundred failed products. Very few of those products fail for engineering reasons. Almost none of them fail because people didn't know how to code or couldn't engineer them. Uh, mostly they fail because they didn't really get the set of criteria and functionality right in a way that the customer actually wanted. Because they weren't really listening to what the customer needed, or they didn't remember or realize that in order for somebody to want something, you needed to have a whole bunch of complementary things. So if I was designing the first car, if I'm Henry Ford, if I haven't thought about the whole system of mechanics and repair shops, my car is pretty useless. If I haven't thought about the whole distribution network for gasoline, my car is useless. Right, and so a lot of what happens is either not understanding the stakeholders around you or not understanding the customer. And so this resilience piece is interesting because there's a sort of resilience in saying my idea's right, my idea's right, and listening and understanding that you have to put your technology into context and into the context of other people. So I'm glad you said that because it's an important skill to think about. Uh, way at the back, yeah. Uh, being trustworthy and being able to trust others. Yes. So I think that's important. Again, it speaks to some of this team issue. Yeah? Motivation, the bane of every single high school to team project. Yes, not enough motivation. Yes. You guys seem to be doing really well. I don't know whether that's because it's much more fun or the free food or some combination of the above. Uh, or maybe it's because you're away from home. <laughs> so it's just generally more interesting. Okay, last, last word. You get the last word. Knowing your strengths and your weaknesses mm -hmm. and like how to ask for help. Yeah, knowing your strengths and weaknesses, which is oddly part of sort of resilience as well, I think, and this kind of management of, of what you're good at and what you aren't good at, and recognizing that we often have to build on the things that we don't find very comfortable. 
When you actually think about it, a lot of what you've described as things you want to do have to do with very technical things, propulsion systems and, you know, surgery and this, that and the other. A lot of the things, these skills that we need are not just those deep technical skills, they're these other sets of skills. And the classic role, I think, that is an incredibly fascinating one in many organizations for what I'm going to call people like you. Um, by which I mean really amazing world-class STEM talent that many of you will grow into having and being. Um, and it took me a while. I first had the image on the left. I just kind of like that image. I like these images, right, of a squiggly blackboard. But I was really tired of the fact that it was a guy in a suit. So I spent a lot of time seeing whether I could change him into being a girl, and I couldn't, so I had to find one of a girl, you know, who also, I'm not sure what she's wearing. But, um, it's for all of us, but a classic role for people like you, I think, is a role of being a chief technology officer. And the reason I think this is really important is that a chief technology officer, right, is really the person that leads some of the really massive and important technical product development challenges in an organization, but they do it in a way that is driving that solution towards something that people really want, that they want to buy, that is gonna solve a big problem. So who was it over there who wanted to do the prosthetics? Yeah. So if that's what you're up to and you're, you know, chief technology officer, your job, right, would be to make sure that you're not just developing cool stuff, but stuff that people want, that's actually robust and reliable, that has the characteristics that doctors can use, right, that could actually get there with the right parts and under the right systems, that could be repairable, that could actually solve the kinds of problems that people today want, that make use of the really cool new materials like graphene and what have you that are going into prostheses. So it's a really interesting role that's way more than just um, technology. It's about how you put your STEM skills actually to work. And so I wanted to just sort of show you a little bit, and I've got two different chief technology officers. The quote on the left is from somebody who's a CTO of a small startup company, like an Axion Systems. Now, Natalia is the CEO, although really she's playing very strongly, she's playing a CTO kind of role, because it's very deep technology. And this person did some sort of, you know, slightly obsessive compulsive track their minute by minute activities. But he says, I'm looking at my time, the data show that my role changes from building the MVP, that's the minimum viable product, that's like the thing that you're building at the moment, the kind of mock-up uh, that's got the minimum functionality, uh, to managing a team to build out the product. So it's a lot about people management. So although all of us start as very deep techie people, we end up having to have people skills. Uh, and so that's a complementary thing that we're all really going to have to develop. And that's a muscle, if you like, that you're going to have to learn to exercise, even though you're much more comfortable probably exercising the technical STEM muscles, if you like. And one of the things I really like about this program is that you have to do quite a lot of that. And as you go along, even though you might be really fascinated by the engineering and the STEM piece of it, I think a lot about the team dynamics that you're experiencing. And just sort of reflect upon those. And, if, and I'm sure some of the teams will have crises. I don't know if any of the teams have imploded yet. That's very good news. Uh, congratulations to all of you for that. Um, in many of the team-based projects I do, I feel as much like a therapist as I do as a professor, because it can be really hard over time. The other example I like is on the right. So uh, Megan Smith was chief technology officer for the US government in the previous administration. She's an MIT grad who was at Google for a period of time and then went and became the chief technology officer for the government, which is a sort of cool job to have. Um, so she, her job was to make sure that the administration harnessed the power of technology, data, innovation to advance the future of our nation. That's a little bit of a big job description. But it's somebody with really deep technical skills who's trying to move very, very big projects. And in doing that, probably needing an awful lot of people and team-based skills. If you want to do startups, these team-based skills matter as well. So investors, if they're going to invest in startup uh, teams, you might think that what they spend their time doing is doing due diligence, analyzing your technology. They actually spend much, much, much more time analyzing the team. So the people who invested in Natalia's company spent as much time calling people to talk about her and the team and how they work together as they did looking at the math underlying the propulsion system. And if you look at this, this is very, very, very old data, but it's a nice pie chart and the data is still true today, is if you look at the founding team problems that tend to lead to failure, a third, two thirds of them have to do with people, not technology. 
So that means that I'm not saying you shouldn't work super hard in your STEM classes. I'm just saying that you need to also think about your people skills and thinking about how to develop them and thinking about the team. You know, teams get kicked around a lot. Working on this kind of stuff is really, really hard. And so you just need people who can get up. And as one of the, the investors who I talk to a lot puts it, you need grit, perseverance, smart, shrewdness, instincts, ability to recruit others. It's a lot about you as a human being deploying other skills. So I want to just talk a little bit to you about a team. So a team is about a small number of people with complementary skills. So it comes back to this issue of program management who are committed to a common purpose, goals, and an approach for which they hold themselves mutually accountable. So you're all in teams at the moment. So this is what you're aiming for, right, is to really think about that. I don't think that you guys got any choice as to who was in your team. I imagine you guys got to decide, pretty much, right? which I think is actually good. And the choices that we tend to have is what kinds of people, how diverse, on what dimensions, how do we manage diversity for productivity, and how do we provide the right incentives? So we all hear a lot about diversity. And by diversity, I mean difference. The most classic dimension of that that we think about is gender and gender identification. But we also mean race. We also mean technical ba you know, background, like skill set. Uh, we can mean socioeconomic. We can mean geographic. And people say today that we need diversity in teams. Now, that sounds very politically correct to me. So the question is, why, is, why might that be true, as well as just being politically correct? Yeah? So you get a mix of ideas. Mm -hmm. So you get a mix of ideas. Yeah? Yes? Well, if you have a diverse group of people, like even, even maybe just racially, you'll get situations from different countries or different places, and you'll like, have a world, like a universal knowledge of like, how you tackle problems around the world. Okay. Yep. Yep. So if you have a different background, different experience, we might think about things in a different way, bring different knowledge to bear. Who haven't I heard from? Uh, oh, the intersection of their unspoken or unfounded assumptions is probably smaller than zero. Yep. So given that we all bring assumptions to the table, maybe we'll all have very different assumptions, which will make it easier for us to question our assumptions. Yep. Uh, it's optimized for getting more things here, different people with different skills instead yep. of Yep. Yeah, so it's sort of optimized for this allocation of skills to the various tasks at hand. Let me just ask you, though, so that all sounds really, really good. So what makes this hard? Because, to be frank, if you looked at the data on self-formed teams, you'd find very, very low levels of diversity. If I, left, if I put you all in a room and said you need to form teams of, let's say, four or five to do a particular task, I guarantee you what would happen is that you would sort yourselves out in a way that if we had some measure of diversity, right, like every team had a measure of difference, it would be extremely low. That you'd actually end up self-sorting, birds of a feather flock together. That expression in sociology is called homophily. People like to be with people like them. So why is diversity, what, what, it sounds great, but what's hard about it? Yeah. OK, so we seek comfort and? Familiarity, yeah? So diversity is hard because we actually feel more comfortable when we're with people who are like us. And we can define like us in any way that feels right to us. So diversity is difficult because we don't feel comfortable. Why else is it difficult? Yeah? It might be harder to understand each other. It might be harder to understand each other. So if our assumptions are very, very different, we can't take very much for granted. So we have to be better at the communication that we talked about as being important sets of skills. Yeah. Yep, so there can be a language barrier. And we might think of that language barrier as just, you know, one person speaks Arabic and the other person speaks English. You could be like me in my household where I speak English and everybody else speaks American. Um, <laughs> And that's a bit of a problem for me, frankly. I'm the odd one out in my home, and I don't understand, and people don't understand me. Um, and it might be language, meaning just how we communicate about our ideas. Anything else? Yeah. It would be harder to harness the relationships since you don't have a lot of people. Yes. So it's actually harder to build relationships at the beginning, because we don't have much in common. So how do we make sense of each other, and how do we get over these frictions? 
And the reason I want to bring this up is that it's very, very politically correct to agree that diversity is really good. And we actually know that's true. And most of the studies show that it is. That diversity is very, very powerful along lots of dimensions. Cognitive, thinking styles, you know, ascriptive characteristics, so things that you kind of ascribe to people, their demographics. But it can be really, really challenging, right? It can lead to this sort of friction. And one thing that way that we think about this, right, is, you know, you've got differences in cognitive styles, problems in communicating, frustration, uh, you know, anger, interpersonal conflict, decreased communication, and then the team kind of implodes and nothing really makes progress. And a different way of thinking about it is, look, you know, we have this, if you think about this as the friction, which can be really create light, it creates heat, and you've got all this abrasion. So diversity leads to what we call effective reactions. We don't communicate well because we just don't understand each other. We're not meaning to annoy one another, but we just do. Because <laughs> we can't get over what the problem is. And then what happens is that our team behavior descends into kind of poor communication and conflict and groupthink, and then you get some really negative long-term consequences. And so one thing that you will start to learn here and that you'll learn in college when you ever do group projects and that is a real key to being successful in this kind of CTO role is to be able to think about managing diversity uh, in a really, really useful way. So these are some of the problems. But let me just show you that there really is evidence way beyond political correctness that this really matters. So these are just some network diagrams from one of my colleagues where they were looking at R&D teams and looking at the diversity among the teams. And basically, if you think about people being diverse, so maybe you and I have very di What's your name? Bernard. Bernard? Bernard and I have very, very different networks, right? He knows a whole bunch of people. I know a whole bunch of people. Very few of the people I know, he knows, right? Or they know, right? So if you drew our two social networks, they probably would overlap almost zero. Some of that is because of age. Some of that's because of gender. Some of that's because of geography, right? You're visiting us from? Alabama. Alabama, there you go, which I've never visited. So, right? So if you looked at these diagrams, right? If I'm the black dot, number one, I've got a whole set of networks. If you're the white one, white dot over there down at the bottom or the crisscrossed one, we know completely different sorts of people. Now, that's very, very helpful because we can draw on people with really different ideas, but it leads to this friction when we're trying to talk to one another and engage. So what we know is that in these diverse teams, you get tremendous amount of low communication and friction. But you also get this richness in external networks, ties to diverse ideas, and so on. And so on average, diverse teams actually do poorly due to lower communication. So actually, diverse teams have some real challenges. But if they can get over their communication barriers, then they way outperform more homogeneous teams. So that's to say that learning how to communicate with people who are different from you is a very, very valuable life skill. And what we see is that good groups who do this sort of thing have these two, what they call sort of distinct periods. They really try, right, to sort of really communicate well for a period of time to kind of brainstorm, right, have that sort of open communication. Then they sort of narrow down on things. They allocate tasks. They do good program management. And then they sort of open up into, again, much higher communication as you're bringing the end of the project together. And so those of you, as you are moving along with your project, just might want to think about what phase of communication you're in and how you deal with those things. Right? And we also know that higher performing groups have not very many dominant communicators. So in poorly functioning groups, there are a small number of people who do all the talking. So some of you will think, oh, that's me. But that means there are a bunch of people who are doing no talking. And so some of you will think, oh, that's me. And so the key here is to try and see how you can all have a voice and to come up with good tricks to make sure that everyone is getting their say. So good team leaders, and I don't know, have you guys allocated team leaders? Have you, are you all just like a flat team, or have any of you put in any structure, like so and so is the leader? Yeah? Well, our teacher Yeah. Okay. And what kind of tricks do you use to make sure you're hearing everybody's voice? How do you make sure? What do you do about that? Yeah. Uh, in, our, in my group, we assign tasks and then say, decide who to do the Okay. Good, right? So you assign tasks. That makes sense. 
how else do you make sure that everybody's ideas get out on the table? Hang on. Yeah, back. Yes. So that is a surprisingly simple statement, really hard to do and very important. So I was at a meeting recently in London with um, a group of people in the, what in Britain is called the Ministry of Defence. And they had a visit from the folks from the Department of Defence. And one of the big advisors to the Department of Defence is Eric Schmidt, who used to be the uh, CEO of Google, who's now the chairman, or just past chairman of Alphabet. Um, you know, he's a super famous person. I, you know, never met him before. One of the things that was most impressive about him was not actually exactly what he said, although he's smart and interesting. It was the fact that every time there was a discussion around the table, and there were about 20 people, if the discussion had gone on for more than maybe seven or eight minutes, and there were a bunch of people who hadn't spoken, he stopped and he said, oh, you know, I haven't heard from Bernard. I haven't heard from Sonzo. What do you think? It was a really striking thing of somebody who's super successful. And the most noticeable thing about him was the degree to which he worked to make sure that he heard everybody's voice in the room. And I thought that was very striking, and it's something that's easy to do, actually, once you start to think about it, is to take a moment and say, hang on, we haven't heard from everybody. What do you think? So just because somebody's quiet doesn't mean they haven't got lots of ideas. The other thing that we know is that we tend, as humans, to interrupt one another. Now, there's been some really interesting studies, actually, mostly of studies of children, about boys and girls interrupting. So who interrupts more, boys or girls? Mm -hmm. It turns out the boy now girls may talk more, right? Just in terms of volume of words. I have a son and a daughter, and I have my own natural experiments at home. Um, the boys interrupt more, and boys are way more likely to interrupt girls than they are to interrupt other boys when they're talking. Mm. Okay, that's just what. Tell me. No, no, no. You had an opinion. Share your opinion. Go on. Okay. Okay. Uh, Share it. That's okay. For the record. For the record. I am not sexist. Don't kill, come after me. Die no, no. After me. That's why we're talking about this out loud. Yes. So, so we can share our views. It's a meme. That's why. I said, it's just asserting your dominance. Don't worry about yeah. it. I'm going to, well, let's carry on and talk about that. Yeah. I think it's because women are smarter, so they know once the men shut up, they can get the work done. <laughs> exactly understand what the number of dominance is referring to like on the slide. So is this supposedly like there is less leader in a group than, well, the dominant might not mean leader, but like what exactly? Sure. So, so these kinds of studies, so there's a whole field of sort of psychological studies of team behavior. So there's a whole field of this. And what they're really doing is if, and actually, so there's some work that I'm doing with one of my graduate students at the Media Lab. and. He's made these badges, and there's a professor there, Sandy Pentland, whom I work with. And so if we were sitting in a meeting, so let's say, one, two, three, four, the five of us were sitting together in a meeting, we can wear these badges, and the badges can collect two things, right? So they can collect the amount of speech that everybody is doing. So over, over the course of a one-hour meeting, they can work out how much air time each of the five of us have. And they're not picking up what you say, but they are picking up the patterns of interaction. So they're, they're seeing... If you speak first, Alex, right? Yeah. So, what's your name? William. William. So does William always speak after Alex, right? Does one of you, what's your name? Ashana. Ashana, right? Does Ashana always interrupt me? Do I always interrupt Alex? Does he always interrupt Ashana? So they're looking at those patterns. And so dominance tends to mean who has the most air time. Right? And that's very, very different from leadership. So I think it's really important that we distinguish those two things. So there is airtime, which is just who's just talking, 
when you have particular expertise, like jet propulsion expertise, in a particular kind of meeting, that might be exactly what you need. Is we're trying to figure out how to solve a problem. You're the expert in the room. We may need you to have the most airtime. But maybe we're at the early stage of the project when we're brainstorming, and we need to get a lot of ideas out there on the table, in which case we need to hear lots of voices. Now, interruption is complicated because some people have a habit, and I have a bunch of colleagues like this who just go on and on and on. They need to self-regulate better, and I may need to interrupt them to get myself heard. The pattern of boys versus girls interrupting is these are all done with these psychometric badges in playgrounds and in preschools and other things. And I'm sure by the time you guys get to high school, you're all much more uh, you know, usefully adapted to life as we know it. But those are true patterns. And they're actually patterns that uh, pertain in meetings in adult sort of context and in business settings. And so being really self-aware about is everybody in the room having a voice in a kind of meeting and project moment where everyone needs to have a voice? Are we in a moment, are we, is somebody keep getting interrupted and just shut down? Are there ways to have voices heard? When is the right moment to just hear from the expert for a period of time? How do we do that? And then if you're the one sitting there feeling like you're not being heard, how do you interject your voice? And if you're a leader in that meeting, how do you say, oh, I haven't heard from you? What are you thinking? And you might say, I don't really feel like I have expertise, but here's what I think. But having that leadership and that maturity to take that role, male and female. And the reason I want to put this gender stuff out here is, is for a few things, right? So one is that that's what I do a lot of work studying, is the role of young men and young women in the, entrep in the innovation economy. Um, how we get diversity, because it's not enough to have diverse people on a team. You have to have inclusion, which means those diverse voices are heard. And if we don't do that, when we're just leaving a massive amount of good ideas on the table. So it's, a really, it's both something that's really uncomfortable to talk about, as we just saw, and it's human to feel uncomfortable about it. It's uncomfortable, I find it uncomfortable in my work, even right now, and I'm, you know, older than most of your parents. Um, it's a tough thing, but it's something that we need to talk about because we all need to kind of learn how to do this better. And this is a job that young women need to do. We need to have vo you need to have voice and give voice to your ideas. And it's a job that young men need to deal with too, which is to kind of tamp down maybe on your desire to interrupt and whatever it might be. Or you might observe that somebody's not speaking. And so we both we all need to play that role. <coughs> so wherever you're from, whatever uh, group you identify with, it's a very important thing. And this is not about compromise, right? This is about setting goals, understanding your style, acknowledging differences in the team, identifying and understanding different points of view. And as I say, this is not about political correctness. It's about getting all the ideas out uh, on the table. There's some really interesting economic studies that showed that if we were to get you know, a more parity of sort of both gender and underrepresented minority individuals into the innovation economy, the amount of economic benefit would be huge. So thinking about how we do that and how we create an environment where we can do that is, I think, an incredibly, incredibly important thing. And that is a role and a set of skills that I think will be really valuable to you guys um, as you move forward. So I'm hoping that in your current projects, uh, you'll think about that just a little bit. Um, in your current projects, you'll take leadership roles, but also listening roles. Uh, and you'll just sort of remember the fact that we do all bring our biases to the table. And we don't always listen as well as we might, male and female, old, young, whoever it might be. And part of going on to be really successful and taking your STEM skills and really being effective as a kind of chief technology officer, which is my sort of representation of kind of really using your STEM skills for good in the world in the long run, is going to be to build up those leadership skills. Um, much of what you do in high school is kind of individual projects. What I love about what you're doing here is you're doing this team stuff. And so I hope that during the course of the next few weeks, you'll kind of reflect not just on the technical accomplishments, but actually on the team-based accomplishments. Um, I'm not going to ask you to sort of psychoanalyze yourselves and write diaries and things, although people do do those kinds of studies. But really thinking about what's going well in the dynamics and what isn't, and how you can make it even better to make your project even better, I think is an important set of skills. And we see that the most effective people not only have those deep technical STEM skills, but they also have those team-based skills. So 
those were some of the thoughts I just wanted to share with you. Um, I hope you have a really fun rest of summer, and I just Bob, want to thank you for inviting me here to talk to everybody. So thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>
and, those, and people will code the male voice as more convincing. So first I need to aim off for the fact that there are massive biases in the world. And then I think I would actually look at the... Um, so the experience of people on teams together is very powerful. And what I would really want is I'd want the experience of a group of people but with some new people on that team. So, you know, I'm not going to answer your question because I, I understand what you're saying. And you, you, you want to push to the extreme cases and say, which are you going to choose? And what I'm going to push back and say is the best teams are ones that have some number of people who worked together before plus new people, which gives new dynamics. What we do know is actually people who pick people who are their friends to start businesses with on average do terribly that actually starting businesses with friends and especially with life, you know, family members is a recipe for disaster. Now, that's different than what you said, but, but it's, it's hard work. But think about adding people that you don't know to teams is very, very powerful and, and useful. Yeah. service, frankly, and they're just saying it because it's a good thing to say. Um, I think a few of them are working really hard to mean that the diverse voices are heard and there's actual meaningful inclusion. That's considerably more work than just checking the boxes. Um, and I'd say there are some tech companies that are doing that, and there's an increasing number of startups doing that. So I spend a lot of time with the MIT startups. It is on the minds of the CEOs of many, many, many of our startups is how to have real meaningful inclusion, because they think they're going to end up with the best outcomes, even if it's a bumpy road to go along. Uh, but I think of the big tech companies, I don't know enough to really um, give you some statistics. But of the really big companies, I've been doing some work with some patent data. Interestingly, a company like IBM does way better on inclusion than a company like Amazon just in the patent statistics. And that's just one thing. The other place that's really interesting is Glassdoor, has some fascinating statistics. So it, these are knowable things. Uh, and I think some are paying lip service and some are doing meaningful things. But it's a very good question. One more question. Yes. Yes. But like, so, like you got like maybe one or two, but did ever have a situation where it helped you more than one? So I think that it's very, very helpful to have a good leader. And again, I just want to make that distinction. Um, and I think in situations where I'm trying to solve a really, if I'm on a very tight deadline and I'm trying to solve a specific problem where I think there's a known set of expertise, and I just keep looking at the jet propulsion expertise, because you're now stuck in my head about that, um, then I would want that. If I'm in a kind of challenger disaster kind of situation, right, or an Apollo mission, I want to hear lots of voices. So I think it depends on where in the phase of the project I am. And so I would say, you know, when I'm at the beginning, I want lots of voices. If I'm kind of in my different tracks of my subsystems, then I probably want some, you know, some dominance that's focused around competence and expertise. And then as I'm doing integration jobs, I tend to want more flat, kind of even. So I think it's, it's sort of over time, it varies. Okay. So with that. Oh, you have a t-shirt for me.